Hello, America, and welcome to the Glenn Beck Program and the network that you are building, The Blaze. Well, the GOP is in disarray, but there is a new knight in shining armor riding to the rescue for the party and the conservative freedom movement. His name? Karov. <laughs> he has started something called the Conservative Victory Project, a pact intended to, and I quote, counter other organizations that have helped defeat establishment Republican candidates over the last two election cycles. Now, gee, who do you think that might be? Let me translate bullcrap to English because I was an, uh, I'm a recovering alcoholic and I have also spent a lot of time around politicians. I speak fluent bullcrap. Here it is. Make sure that the GOP establishment holds on to power and crush anyone that's in their way, including the Tea Party or any freedom movement. We're all expected to bow down at the altar of the architect, the man so brilliant, he was somehow or another able to beat Al Gore. <laughs> and not only Al Gore, John Kerry, two guys whose personalities are so dull they make watching continental drift seem exciting. This architect doesn't want anyone to actually remember that he lost the popular vote the first time to Al Gore, a guy who claimed he invented the internet and terrified America by this really, really disturbing kiss with his wife. And I mean, how, how did you lose the popular vote to that? He also wants you to forget that just last year, people gave him half a billion dollars just to beat a failed president who's a socialist. And his big idea was to nominate the candidate who in the end said, you know what, I agree everything you're saying here on the war and everything else. Wait a minute, what? Where did that come from? This is an architect who gave us a president who doubled the national debt from $5 trillion to $10 trillion, who led the Republican Party transformation into the progressive light party with big spending cuts and bailout, otherwise known as TARP. Yes, the bank bailout was George W. Bush. Oh, and by the way, one of the side benefits of that, uh, the country now largely hates Republicans and conservative ideas. Oh, by the way, um, one of the other things that I just love, the dandy GOP stalwart helped us get, is uh, the fluorescent light bulb. That was also George W. Bush. Rove will say, oh, well, we support many Tea Party candidates. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But what Rove does is he puts the premium on winning and not principle. Who cares what they believe as long as they win? He's still playing the establishment game. We end up fielding candidates with spines made of jello that will reshape to fit whatever mold is popular at the moment, and that doesn't do us any good. Following Karl Rove's idea this time would mean that people like Ted Cruz and Mike Lee would be out instead of in. And we'd get more Scott Browns and Lindsey Grahams. Well, I just love him. And a party in disarray because it doesn't stand for anything. Well, we've got to do something because the GOP is on fire. Well, he'll tell you that we're going to make the tent even bigger, more inclusive. But that is not true. First of all, let me give you two things about a tent. If you have a tent, the things that are the most important on a tent, not the little flag at the top, not the fabric, not the size of the door, or even the size of the tent. What is important are the stakes on the tent because without the stakes the entire tent falls they hold it up nobody can tell me what the stakes of the republican party even are they represent our values and our principles oh, well we've got a platform i don't even know what your platform is and you could be, you could be on the platform and talk about the platform all you want but you violate it every single time the only stake that is important to you is one that nobody in the end really cares about, and that is winning. So what if you win? You win what? And then what do you do? Well, we have to win again, so we'll just do whatever is popular. Well, I don't want to be in that tent. I don't know anybody that wants to be in that tent. I'm tired of that tent. Some of us actually believe in something. But that's why the tent is falling. That's why the Republicans can't seem to hold it up. 
They're saying, well, we should be more like the rest. We should be more moderate. We should like the rest of the country. No, 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 we shouldn't. At least not your definition, because I don't think you even know who the, who the country is. Instead of redefining or replanting the stakes and giving a, a, the people a reason to come in, they just cut down the ropes of everybody else's tent. Well, nobody else will have a tent, and then they'll have to come into ours. That, that's, that's, I don't even know who those people are. We're not living in the old school GOP world that Karl Rove still lives in. I at least believe that both sides, not just the Democrats, both sides are responsible for the economic mess that we're in. They're both responsible for the war that is just never seeming to end. People are fleeing the parties and they are standing somewhere in between. Now, let me give you conventional thinking and then I'll show you what I think is happening. Here's the GOP and the DNC. They're right here. This is a scale of freedom. On this end is total anarchy. On this end is total government, fascism, communism, totalitarianism, the theocratic state, whatever it is, total control on this side, total anarchy on that side. Freedom scale. The founders put our constitution out here. Originally, the Articles of Confederation were here, but it was anarchy. It was too close to total freedom. So they had to move it here. The Occupy Wall Street movement, the libertarian, the, the on-the-edge libertarian that, that, are, that want the country to burn down, are over here in anarchy. Yeah, well, we'll fix it by, well, we'll have the total government collapse. That's a few nut jobs over here. And anarchists. Over here is the media, Hollywood, EDU, and also the real Occupy Wall Street. They are somewhere here from the moderates. They're somewhere over where the DNC is and closer to the communists. That's where they are. The GOP is here. They'll tell you, the media will tell you that these are the moderates. Somewhere in between here. But I don't think that's where the moderate people are. The moderate people are leaving. Look, here's, what, here's exactly what happened. The people in the DNC that occupy this space, I don't know, they went dead inside. Some of them left and become, became GOP members during the Clinton years. Some of them left and became GOP you know, now. And so they're, they're over in this area. But these people never, they, were, they had a hostile takeover of what was called the new party. And they, they just, they became something else. They shape-shifted into bigger and bigger government people. And this scale is moving this way. And what Karl Rove is saying, hey, people aren't happy with the GOP. So we have to become more moderate and move this way to apparently this piece, which keeps moving towards bigger and bigger government. The people I know, at least, uh, are sick of these guys. They don't like this solution, and they're sick of these guys. I mean, how many people voted last time? How many, how many people voted? How many were there? How many people didn't vote in this country? That means this pool that refuses to play in here, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. And more people from this half are jumping out. They don't want anything to do with it because they think these guys are too big of a government too. I'm one of them. So I jump in over here. This is the Tea Party. Somewhere between the Constitution and, I don't know, the smallest government GOP guy that you can think of. That's all of this. That space here. That, that, this is America. This is the opportunity. Why would we continue to play for a sliding scale that's moving farther and farther towards total government and is getting smaller and smaller? It doesn't make any sense. Most people are libertarian at heart. But if no one is defining it, it's like, it's, it's like herding cats. And if you've ever tried to herd cats, they don't herd up. They don't stay together. And that's the real problem with libertarians. They don't stay together. Well, they're not designed to stay together, right? Because we're all individuals. It's the strongest part of the libertarian movement that we're independent, and that we chart our own course, and that shouldn't and couldn't ever be taken away. But in this case, the problem is that each one of the cats wants to say that their little litter box is the least smelly, and it's only the cats that use that litter box that belong to the cat family. Well, that defies the definition of liberty and libertarianism entirely. A libertarian believes in maximum freedom, 
maximum freedom with just enough security to be able to hold a community together. It is also my understanding that a libertarian believes that if it neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg, what difference does it make to me? That's Thomas Jefferson. But there are many in the Libertarian Party now, or Libertarian movement, that would cheer for the government to be burned down. That's not a Libertarian, that is an anarchist. And that is somebody throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Wouldn't it be better if we understood that the Constitution is what holds us together? And then we start teaching people freedom principles. I am more libertarian today than I was four years ago, and even more libertarian than I was eight years ago. The more I see, the more I learn, the more libertarian I become, because I see what doesn't work. It's easy to make the case what doesn't work, but you have most of the country saying, yes, but what does work? And it's only have these choices. No, there's another choice. In 2001, when I said, there have to be sunsets to the Patriot Act, I was worried about what could happen with the Patriot Act. But I said yes to sunsets because I really thought that people believed in the Constitution. I thought we, we all wanted people to be free and chart their own course, but boy, was I stupid. And now we have the Patriot Act without sunsets. And that wasn't just one party, it was both parties. I don't want my government in my bedroom or the boardroom. Get the hell out and leave us alone. But Karl Rove, he would say, try them, try them, and you may, I say. No, I've tried them. I do not like your green eggs and ham. And for the first time in a hundred years, I believe the libertarian movement could have their seat put back by the table. Everybody complains every four years, how come the libertarians aren't it? I wonder. Maybe it has to do with history and Woodrow Wilson and Theodore Roosevelt removing that chair from the table. And then the media and Hollywood and the political machine crushing the life out of anybody who says they're for freedom. And they don't want to play inside the little, the little fenced area that the Republicans and the Democrat had fenced up. You, for the first time, have a chance to win the presidency in 2016. You could have real libertarians in record numbers in Congress. If we teach libertarianism, if we teach what it means to be free, and if those of us who are moving closer and closer to it learn it, and you're welcomed into the tent, we have more in common as people then we have different. And, and I, mean that with, I mean that with people who are, are die-hard Democrats. We have more in common than we have. It's different. And as long as we have the Constitution, man was endowed with certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and you're not going to violate these things in the Constitution, boy, we can come together. And it's our differences that make us strong. We don't, we don't have to be all alike. Remember, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. The secret is to try to find enough people that are willing to find common ground and put those stakes in the ground and maybe a pitch a tent. New principles that seem new to everybody, but they are the oldest principles in the book. And principles that we can really pretty much agree on. I mean, the federal government is out of control, one way or another. I mean, if you would just change the, uh, the D to an R, every Democrat would say this government is out of control. But they're blinded by the parties. But anybody's honest knows it's not working. The federal government should spend less than it takes in. That's pretty common sense, isn't it? Organizations like the Fed, it's corrupt. The banking system run by the Fed is corrupt and should be abolished. The dollar is being destroyed. Any thinking person that looks that they are printing dollars and knows anything about history knows it won't work. You have to have sound money. 
Any thinking person knows our military is overextended all around the globe. What are we even doing there? Every thinking person knows the enemy of my enemy is my friend is a foreign policy that has failed. Any thinking person knows you cannot nation build. It doesn't work. Can we not agree that war should be declared? And if it is declared, then we should unleash the full power and might of the United States military, get the job done, and come home. We should mind our own business, quite honestly. Stay out of other nations' affairs. We should attack when we're attacked. What is this minority report in future crimes? Boy, it sure seemed to make sense to me ten years ago. It doesn't. Do you know... Do you know what was on our first coin as a country? That's it. That's it. Mind your business. Mind your business. Not in God we trust. Mind your business. Maybe we should put that back on our money. Quick, before it goes out of style. Spreading democracy around the globe, however noble the idea may be, is not working. Besides, it's not constitutional. And it's not common sense. Think about this. We're around the world going, we are so cool. Can you tell me anybody who's ever been converted to an ideology or philosophy by the person who says, man, I'm awesome. You should be like me. And we're like, I don't think you're really that awesome. They send troops over and like, no, I'm going to build a house just like mine for you. It doesn't work. Why did they send us the Statue of Liberty? Because we were minding our own business. And France was like, hey, you know what? They've got the pretty good idea over there. Let's send them a big birthday, Ken. That's what they did. They sent it. They, that was a gift to us. Is anybody sending us any cool gifts? No. Why? Because we don't mind our own business anymore. We're too busy going around the world saying how cool we are. Nobody likes that. Here's the best way to spread our ideas around the globe. Have values and principles. And then actually live them. Can you even imagine the hypocrisy that the Chinese felt just a couple of years ago when we were over there going, no, no, you guys, your accounting rules are all wrong. You banks have got to listen to us for a while. Can you imagine what they thought of us? Stop being a hypocrite. Have principles, live by them, and let the results do the talking. Then people will send us really cool statues as birthday presents. Others will follow. Others will fo uh, follow suit. In the next couple of years, I'm going to do more and more shows on libertarianism, and we're hiring more and more libertarians because I believe it's time, and I can't believe I'm saying this, it's time for a third party because the Karl Roves in the world are going to kill us. The secret to sanity and safety of our country, our republic, and our constitution has got to be a different way. In the end, there will only be two parties, and I believe it will be the Republicrats, because they're just going to melt into one, and some sort of a freedom party that understands the Constitution and real freedom. Libertarians, are you up to the challenge? Because this is your time. Whether you know it or not, will you open up your heart and your mind to people who are starting to learn about it and want a new home? Or do they have to be a robot and exactly like you and squat in your kitty litter box? Or can we find enough things that bring us together? We have to start defining the stakes. And tonight we'll do that with the, one of the smartest libertarians I know. He's up next. My good friend, Judge Andrew Napolitano, Fox News senior uh, judicial analyst and author of uh, Theodore and Woodrow, um, which I think you wrote it just for me. I think you did. <laughs> the man I love to hate, Woodrow Wilson. How two American uh, presidents destroyed the Constitution. Um, and also the Freedom Answer book, uh, how the government is taking away your constitutional uh, freedoms. Um, Judge, it is good to see you. Thank you. And you've lost, like, a... you're like half the man I knew before. You've You're lost... talking about physical, not moral. <laughs> well, no. <laughs> nice um, to be no, here yeah. with you. Thank you. You've lost what? How much weight? I've lost about 60 pounds. You stopped eating wheat? Yes. Okay. Not easy to do. Pick up a can of tomato soup, there's wheat in it. It's everywhere. 
That's why I keep eating wheat. <laughs> um, and look at me. Um, uh, uh, so I want to talk to you about, um, because we had a conversation in my office a little while ago, and, and um, uh, I, I think, you heard the monologue, I think there is an opportunity that hasn't been seen since Theodore and Woodrow. Would you agree? With respect to what's going to happen to libertarians. Yeah, libertarians have a chance to put their, their chair back at the table and say, small, limited, constitutional government. And Woodrow Wilson did everything he could to design those two parties and keep progressives everywhere. Well, when, when you present libertarianism the way you did in the monologue at the outset of the show, small, limited, constitutional government, leave me alone. Stay out of my bank book, stay out of my bedroom. That's very appealing. Most people right. in their heart of hearts want to be left alone. I don't mean isolated, but I mean right. alone from power, alone from the let government, alone from being told how to live. Right. I, 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 let, me just, let me just do what I do. And if I break a law, come and, but I don't need to fill out all this paperwork and I don't need all of these laws. You're, 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 you're stopping me from pursuing happiness. Well, let me tell you how many laws we have in this country. There's over, there's over 4,500 federal criminal laws. And if I were to take all of the federal laws, in, it's in a uh, set of books called the United States Code, and put them on a bookshelf, it would consume about eight or nine Encyclopedia Britannica sets. It's hard to imagine that any one person has read all those laws or understands them, but we know from history, the more laws, the less liberty. The less liberty, the less likely that that society will survive as a free society, because whoever takes over the government has an opportunity to find some law that somebody has broken, and they will find sure. that law use it in, order to, in order to isolate right. that person. Right. I, I was talking to John Mackey today. Do you know who he is? I do. I'm yeah. a big fan of his. Big fan. I buy my food at, uh, Whole, at Foods. Uh, Whole Foods. Yeah, he's the CEO of Whole Foods. He's, um, he's a brilliant, brilliant man. Um, and he was pointing out that we have gone from, in just four years, I believe, we have gone from the third most economically free nation to the 18th most free economic nation. And there's no way that you can, um, that, that we're going to survive like this. You well, can't. Be before Theodore and Woodrow, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going to take Lincoln out of the equation because he, he lived in the most unique times in our history, or was mm -hmm. president in the most unique times in our mm -hmm. history, the Civil War. But from George Washington to William McKinley, the president who preceded Theodore Roosevelt, all those presidents, Lincoln out of the equation, believed and understood that the Constitution created a federal government of limited powers, that the federal government could only do aspects of nationhood, defend us from invasions, operate the post office, operate a justice system, preserve patents and trademarks but that the, the real boat of government would be rowed by the states, and the states would be different. They wouldn't be forced to conform. So if you didn't like the taxes in New Jersey, you could move to Pennsylvania. If you didn't like the regulation in Massachusetts, you could move uh, to New Hampshire. Woodrow Wilson and Theodore Roosevelt changed all that. They did not believe that the Constitution means what it says. It says it's the supreme law of the land, and it says the federal government can only do the powers delegated to it. They believed that the Constitution authorized the federal government to do anything it wanted, right. except what is expressly prohibited in the Constitution. Now that turns everything on its mm -hmm. head. So instead of the federal government justifying where it got the power to do something, it became the obligation of those offended by the use of that power to show where the federal government was prohibited from doing what it wanted. And so we've created a place where Chris Rock came out yesterday and he said, look, Chris we have Rock. To, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, but that is popular culture. I mean, yes. I you talk to people, who, yes. you know, 20-somethings, they get their news from Jon Stewart. Um, and so Chris Rock came out and he said, look, um, the president is uh, like our boss. He's like our dad, and we have to listen to him. No, I'm sorry, but I've never worried. Has anybody else worked for a boss where you pay them? <laughs> where, yeah. I mean, where, where, the, where you, we're well, the boss. It's, it's an interesting argument. N not only has the federal government stolen power from the states and taken liberty from individuals, but the president has stolen power from the Congress and from the courts. The president is almost like a prince or a king. Mm -hmm. I mean, three days ago... 
The president's people released to NBC News of all places a 16 page document saying that the president can kill Americans. No, 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 no. An informed high office official. Yes, an informed high official of the U.S. government. Whoever that may be. Uh, I know who it is. Did you see today? Anybody know? It's John Brenner. So John Brenner is, and it, and it was described, his office is in the basement of the White House. He draws up the list of who the president should kill and authorize and then make the case to the president. Well, this He's is the guy who said Al-Quds instead of uh, Jerusalem. He is a radical well, from the get-go. Th this, this is the power claimed by kings and tyrants. Mm -hmm. This is the power that we fought against letting George III have so that we could become free and independent states. This is the whole reason we have a constitution and a Fifth Amendment that guarantees that if the government wants life, liberty, or property, they can only acquire it via due process, meaning a jury trial, because the constitution doesn't repose in the hands of one person, whether the president or John Brennan or anybody that any president might appoint the power to decide who to kill. It doesn't repose that in the hands of any one individual. Um, okay, so let, let, um, let's go to... Um, I have a heck of a time. You and I have known each other for a long time. Right. What do you have a heck of a time? Um, uh, I have a heck government. of a time. No. I have a hell of a time with the government. <laughs> I have a heck of a time with um, people. I mean, quite honestly, Judge, and you know this, you used to piss me off, and I'm sure I used to piss you off. Um, it, during the you know, September 11th days, you were talking about, you can't do the Patriot Act. And I'm like, it's got a sunset. We've got to do it. A, I was wrong. You were right because of the nature of government. It just keeps gobbling more power. And the nature of people that get in the government. Okay. They're not small government right. people. They're busybodies who right. want to tell us how to live. Okay, so um, now that I get it, now libertarians are like, you're not a libertarian. Well, I, I, fa I fail to see the litmus test here. And what, is, what are the stakes of the libertarian movement? What are the principles that you say, you know, these five things or ten things, whatever it is, these are the cornerstones of libertarianism, I'll, I'll and give you, you have to have those. I'll give you a couple. The, the first is the, the non-aggression principle. You, you can't punch me in the nose, I can't punch you in the nose. You can't take my property, I can't take your property. And what I can't do, I can't empower the government to do. This so one is a great one. Explain so that one. I this one is great. If I can't take your property or punch you in the nose, I can't authorize the government to do it because the government derives its powers from the consent of the governed. So, so when, the, what so we can't do, we can't authorize the government to do. It's so pretty basic. When the government says, you know, uh, y y somebody down the street makes more money than you, um, you couldn't go and take their car or their money and so when somebody in the government says, well, they're different than you, so I'll go take it. I'll go take that extra money. You don't have that power, so you can't give them that power to do it. However, you do have the power from stopping somebody to come in robbing your house. That's, that's the Second Amendment. You have the right and responsibility to hold somebody or shoot somebody if they are aggressive towards you, you fear for your life, you can shoot them. That's, that's a, a profound danger of this government. In it, th this administration of uh, Barack Obama, their efforts to take away our right to defend ourselves. Look, the Second Amendment, I know you don't like me saying this, the Second Amendment was not written to protect your right to shoot deer. I do so. I okay. say this all the time. It was, for, it was written to protect your right to shoot the bad guys when the government can't or won't. And here's the difficult part. It was written to protect your right to shoot at the government if it is taken over by tyrants. That's how we became a country. You know, I, we shot at the king's soldiers and we beat them because we had military equipment equal to or better than theirs, and we won. And they went home, and we created a free government. However, the, the shot heard around the world actually started because the king said, uh, the king's soldiers came in and said, We've got, we're going to go take those guns from the armory, and, uh, and we're taking your guns. And if I'm not mistaken, the colonial troops said, no, you can go take those things that are yours in the armory, but you are not taking our guns. And so they allowed them to take what was the king's, but not his, not theirs. That, they had that, and they parted the ways for the 
But the soldiers didn't want that. They also were, re were re being required to take the citizens' guns. That's how that started. Well, sure, but if, if, the, if the colonists had had their guns registered with king, the king's agents in London, as ahead. the federal government wants us to do now, well, then Jefferson and Washington would have been captured and hanged, and, and we wouldn't have become a, a free country because they would have known where to take the guns from and they would have rolled all over us as well. If the king's soldiers had gunpowder and the colonists were forced to use crossbows, Jefferson and Washington would have been captured and hanged and we somebody, never would have been free. Somebody said to me the other day, and I don't even know where this came from, it just came out of my mouth, but somebody said to me the other day, they said, oh, well, you're not going to be able to take on the federal government. They have planes and tanks and everything else. So you're not going to be able to do it. And I said, wow, you've just made the best case that we already have too much gun control. Yes. Because yes. if we can't beat them, then they've already controlled far too you, much. You Hang on. To hold the thought back sure. in just a second. All right, so um, let's go to another stake of the libertarian movement. There's a lot of libertarians who will say, well, you can't be a libertarian if you believe in God. Well, I am an old-fashioned, traditional, pre-Vatican II Roman Catholic. I, I recognize that there's a home in the libertarian movement for people who have all kinds of beliefs. But one of the core stakes, as you like to say, libertarian beliefs, is that our rights come from our humanity and our humanity comes from God. And the only thing we have absolutely perfectly in common with the God who created us is, as he is perfectly free, we are perfectly free. So the, the great majority of libertarians believe that our freedom is a gift from the creator. There are many libertarians who believe, I do not, Glenn does not, that human beings are the highest and greatest thing in existence and that human beings have made their own freedom. But no libertarian believes that freedom comes from the government. All believe it comes from within us. Whether we are the creator of it or God's instrument, it comes from us, not the government. Okay. Um, uh, when I think of I think when America thinks of libertarians, and when I think of the ones that always get the most attention, it, it, the, the press will immediately go, well, so you want heroin on the streets tomorrow? You want, to, you want all drugs to be legalized? You want heroin? Well, everybody knows that the war on drugs is a dismal failure. Doesn't work. Everybody knows that we spend $50 billion a year fighting a losing battle and incarcerating people who need medical help they do not need to go to a jail where they will be made they will be made worse my view and the view of most libertarians you own your own body you don't own the body of the baby growing in your body if you're a woman but you own your own body you have the right to take into your body what you wish you're responsible for what you do you can't do this with your okay. children that's the problem that I have because nobody will take the responsibility. We're not, you know, the founder said this is a wholly inadequate system for, if, for an irreligious or amoral people. Well, if a libertarian is in favor, for example, of um, decriminalizing marijuana, but thinks the government should take care of him for what he does while he's under the influence yeah, no. of it, he's not a libertarian at all. Yeah, no. That's not the role of government to ta to stop you from ingesting what you want or to take care of but you here's, because you don't ta you don't take care of yourself. Here's the one thing that I think uh, people could win on the drugs. I know several people. It seems like so many people that I know have cancer, and some of them are terminal, and they can't get they can't get treatments. I know because I, the Kansas, FDA won't let right. them. I, if I have cancer, I'm dying, man. I'm dying. I'm willing to try out that new thing because I got nothing left anyway. Correct. Let me let me try it, and if it doesn't work on me, maybe they'll learn something Theodore, to help somebody else. But Theodore and Woodrow started this regulatory state. You see, they created a part of the government that wasn't fish or fowl. It wasn't in the executive branch. It wasn't in the legislative branch. It wasn't in the judicial branch. It just became regulators, and they would regulate the food that we would eat and the money that we would pay to deliver goods across interstate lines. And the prince among those, princess among those, is the Food and Drug Administration, yeah. which now regulates everything from uh, soda pop everything. to to chewing gum. Okay, so let me go. Let me go. This Could we, T Tiffany, do you have that uh, clip from It's a Wonderful Life? This I think should be. Uh, yeah. if, uh, I think this should movie. be used. Where am I going to look? To well, see look it? behind you. I think this is what should be used for the debate with libertarians on um, 
uh, on uh, responsibility uh, responsibility for the, the answer of you, know, you just want to legalize all drugs and alcohol yeah well, watch this from its wonderful life those things in the car and i'll get your time ready for you now hurry up okay mom now you coming don't later drop one of them. you coming later george what do you mean it'd be bored to death or? wouldn't want a better death lots of pretty girls we're gonna use that new floor tonight too oh, work. No, no gin tonight son oh pop just a little no sir not one drop uh boys and Kay. girls Stop. and music what? here's what happened he's 18 years old his father says no gin tonight son come on dad just a little no not a drop all right. It, it, it wasn't the government that was regulating. Correct. It. it was the family had built the core of respect. And dad said, no gin tonight, son. Okay. Well, one of the libertarian uh, heroes, Edmund Burke, said, the, the less regulation there is from within, the more regulation yes. will come to us from without. So as society be. gets less and less personally responsible, the government gets stronger and stronger and wants to control uh, our lives. This is why, this is why I'll live in a libertarian community with, with absolutely no drug rules or anything else with you and me and, and Penn Jillette. Penn Jillette. Penn Jillette doesn't believe in God. You and I both do. I'm an alcoholic, so I learned the hard way. Penn's never had a drop of alcohol, not interested in it. He regulates himself. It, and this is why we've been working so hard on trying to get people to look at George Washington, look how he lived his life, you know, do the 30 challenge and find, I don't care if you find God, um, you know, any way you find God, if it helps you regulate yourself and be charitable to each other by choice, not by force, because the government becomes absolutely obsolete when our communities say, Oh, yeah, we don't really need more cops. But we have a society in which half the people who live here receive a substantial portion of their income from the government. Either they work for it, they sell a product uh, to it, or they receive entitlements on which they rely for their subsistence. That is not going to change overnight. Those people need the government to, okay. to, to live. So, and they have an incentive of sending representatives to the government who will give them a bigger piece of the pie. So then let me start there. I'm going to come back and I want to talk to you because you just said it's going to take a long time to change that. I believe, and I'd love to hear your answer when we return, I believe that the argument that Theodore and Woodrow Wilson had with the communists back then which was, look, we agree on the same thing. You know, you've done your homework on this. We agree oh, yeah. on this. There's one difference. You want revolution to accomplish it. We don't. That, that won't work in America. It's not a good idea. And so we'll take little baby steps. We'll arrive at the same place, but we'll make it progressive. Can that was the argument. Hang on just a sec. I think now we're having the same argument with the libertarians who say i want it absolutely pure and if the government fails it'll be all better for us we'll have a revolution so we can restore the constitution i think this is the same argument except in reverse but a hundred and, years later theodore and woodrow have triumphed i know so let, let, then answer that question and tell me tell me how do we convince people who are die-hard libertarians Learn from the lesson of the past and reverse the process. Back next. Complex um, uh, answers, and we have a very limited amount of time. So, first one. How do you convince libertarians to reverse the process the way the progressives did? Well, you have to recognize that it's taken the progressives 100 years to get to where we are now, and you can't undo everything that they did in 100 years overnight. Right. The, the basic mantra is Jefferson's. That government is best, which governs least. Now, if you take that a step further and say that government is better, which governs not at all, then you, then you have chaos. Right. So the, 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 the goal is minimal government, maximum individual freedom. The other goal is to recognize natural rights, areas of human behavior, thought, speech, worship, travel, privacy, immune from government regulation, for which you don't need a government permission slip. If you keep those two goals in mind, you can gradually wind down the government, but it will take generations to do it. Okay, second one. Um, what stops me from um, uh, the whole bandwagon on war is sometimes you have to fight war, and I think we both agree, you, hit our, you take our towers down, we come and pound you into glass, but then we leave. We're not going to fix your country or anything else. We punish to set the record straight, you don't punch us in the nose. Right. Um, and then you leave. But Israel is confusing because Israel is, is being set up 
I stand with Israel. I don't want to fight their war, but I also don't want them to be set up. How do we support without having entanglements? Well, we have friends in the world, just like we uh, have friends in the neighborhood and friends in the family and, and friends at work, and you have alliances with friends. You stick by your friends. So if so your you friends are in trouble and need help, you provide them with help. We can provide them with a lot of help, moral, financial, scientific, and military, well, there's but a lot without, of putting, without putting our own people uh, But a at lot risk. of libertarians will say, what's gotten us into this mess is we send money and planes and everything else over to Israel. Well, That's the whole Jewish what's, lobby thing. What's, what's gotten us into this mess is a, the belief that we can put democracy in places where it, it, the seeds will never flourish. So if you take a, a free person and may, turn him into a slave, you're going to have a revolution. If you take a slave and give him freedom, you're going to have revolution. You can't do the latter overnight. That's what happened in, in Egypt, and that's why the governments keep, uh, keep toppling over there. Do you, Each, Israel is a worthy and devoted friend. Uh, and we should stick by our friends. I'm not saying we should, we should send troops into the streets right. of Jerusalem, but we should stick by our friends. Okay. How concerned are you by uh, people like Karl Rove, who will f do everything he can to destroy the Tea Party and libertarian movement, and people, e even in his own camp, that will try to co-opt libertarianism and say, you know what, I'm just like you, bring you in until, and, you know, and not really help, and then punch punch it out. When Carl it is a very talented guy and I would try and win him over to my side and I would make the following argument. The Republican Party is going to go in one of two ways. It's going to become Democrat light and then it will pass into history like its predecessor the Whigs because it won't offer people anything. It won't put a fire in anybody's belly. Or it's going to become that government is best which governs least. That puts a fire in which people's belly. Which one do you think belly. it's going to do? I don't know. Obviously, I pray for the latter, and, and my career are... is now devoted to bringing about the latter. Um, I think that Jim DeMint leaving and, and some of the others that are leaving or have left um, uh, kind of signal to me they think the Lindsey Grahams and the John well, McCain are going to win. If the Republican Party goes in that direction, then another party will flourish okay, yeah. because there needs to be a natural home for lovers of freedom. You'd have no problem with a third party? No, no. We need an, an, an instrument to to channel the political efforts of those who believe that government is best which governs least and if the democrats they've rejected it for a hundred years if the republicans reject it another instrument will grow okay um, two books that you have to have in your library theodore and woodrow and the freedom answer book and if judge napolitano is ever ever in your area and you get a chance to hear him speak he is i believe the best speech giver i have ever seen on any stage in america and that includes reagan and everybody else present company excluded yeah, no i don't think so but he is fantastic thank you so much judge thank you, appreciate Glenn. it back Pleasure. in a minute thank you